Hey there, welcome to John Gets Games. Uh, today I'm doing a uh, live vlog, obviously, but this is a little bit different than normal. Um, this is going to be a discussion topic, essentially, about rondelles, specifically uh, rondelles, what they are, and what they do for games. Um, now, I'm going to talk about the details of um, what I mean by that soon, but uh, before I get into that, I would like to ask uh, that if you do enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you enjoy uh, watching and listening to content like this, then I do hope you would consider directly supporting the channel, and you can learn more about doing that by going to patreon.com slash Uh On that note, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about um, this topic. <laughs> uh, now, this started off as a uh, Patreon uh, reward. Every single month, I do a bonus video, and it is uh, requested by and voted on by the contributing producer-level supporters at the Patreon campaign. Uh, for last month, a uh, top 10 list for Rondell Games won, and this was a... <laughs> I didn't really expect how much effort, time, and interesting conversation conversations would come out of this. Um, as obviously, I'm not making a top 10 list, so I've tweaked things a little bit. I've changed the scope quite a bit. In fact, I'll tell you right now that I'll be talking about 20 games today instead of 10. <laughs> um, now, on that note, um, I do think I should start things off by talking about what a rondelle is. <laughs> Some people are going to be familiar with this, others aren't. And honestly, the process of researching this video was fascinating for me. I learned a lot and I had some great discussions, but beginning at the start, um, from a non-board gaming perspective, uh, the definition of a rondelle is a circular object, oftentimes a jewel or a jewelry ring. Uh, now, in board games, um, rondelles have been used for a long time uh, as a action selection uh, system, essentially. In fact, uh, on Board Game Geek, it says um, a rondelle is an available uh, the available actions are represented as pie wedges in a circle, and each player has one or more tokens on the rondelle's wedges. On their turn, they may move their token uh, around the rondelle and perform the action indicated on the wedge where they stop, and it is typically more costly to move forward um, further on that rondelle. Uh, now, that is kind of the official rondelle definition, um, at least as far as Board Game Geek is concerned. And when I started really looking into this, I realized that if I was to go strict on this definition, um, this would not be a very interesting video. <laughs> There's honestly not that many games that specifically use this definition. And the more conversations I had with people um, asking my friends like, well, what do you think a rondelle is? And what do you think a rondelle game is? I got so many different uh, opinions and ideas, which I thought was fascinating. So I do want to start off by saying in this video, I'm going to be using a looser definition of rondelle than what Board Game Geek has. I'm going to start there, but I'm going to work um, off from that. Um, now, this is not a top 10 list. As I said, I'm talking about 20 games, but they are not ordered in any personal preference uh, order. Uh, instead, I tried to um, weave these together in a bit of a journey through rondelles or rondelle-like mechanisms um, to see how these games are similar and different from each other. And um, right there at the very end, I'll tell you right now, the last two games uh, really stretch that definition. I'll see what people think about those. But every single one of these games came up in the um, multiple conversations that I had with many different friend groups. Um, I actually went out of my way to play several Rondell games um, over the last month because I wanted to, you know, research the topic a little bit more. And some of them I just hadn't gotten around to. And this was a good excuse to do that. Um, so on that note, I think we can now um, start things off and go into the first game. <laughs> and I already clicked the wrong button. There we go. Uh, the first game is Navigador. Uh, now I'm starting here because this is probably the closest game on this list to that specific definition. Um, the Rondell definition that we talked about just a minute ago um, is largely tied to Matt Gertz uh, design games, and Navigador is a Matt Gertz design game. Um, if we look out here, you can see there is this uh, pie wedge wheel in the middle of the table. There are tokens on that wheel, and um, those tokens are associated with the players. So that means on your turn, you're going to move forward. Um, I believe in this game, it's a one to three spots. And if you want to keep going further, you can spend resources to do that. And wherever you land, you will do the action on that spot. Um, so this is, you know, the classical version of it. And it's great, <laughs> by the way. I really like this game. Uh, but, you know, in this uh, rondelle, you are doing a variety of things that can kind of set you up. Uh, for example, there's a sailing action. And right after that, there's a worker action. And after that, there is a market, which gets you money. And then there is colony. Now, in order to do a colony action, you are going to need workers, and you are going to need to move your ships around to get positioned to those uh, colonies. So this has kind of the classical uh, rondelle uh, tension of how fast do I go or how slow do I go. And if you want to go really fast, you can spend extra stuff to make that happen. Um, now, uh, after that, you can uh, get uh, some, uh, let's see here. 
Oh yeah, um, I can't remember the name of it. It's too small. But after that, you can get some uh, extra in-game bonuses, and then you can build shipyards to make more ships so that you can sail more and get more workers to then colonize. And it's, it's more complicated than that. But you're just going around and around on this um, rondelle and doing all of these things. And I think everyone would agree that this is a rondelle. Um, now. I'm kind of calling this the standard uh, pay more type of rondelle because you can pay to go a little bit farther. And that is going to lead me into the next game I'm going to talk about, which is Sovereign Skies. Now, this one uh, also has the standard pay more style of rondelle. Um, on the uh, board, you have, uh, first of all, it's a modular board. So this is a difference from games like Navigador. And um, uh, on this rondelle, each player has their own token, and you can go clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, now, this is why I wanted to talk about Sovereign Skies as um, compared to Navigador, because in Navigador, you can only go clockwise around that wheel. And in fact, most of the uh, rondelle games that um, are, you know, fit that classic definition go clockwise. But Sovereign Skies throws a little bit of a wrench into that, where you can go clockwise or you could spend um, a decent amount of resources to turn around and then go in the other direction. Um, now, I did mention that this is a modular board, so every time you play, you're going to shuffle these up. So that means your uh, rondelle of actions is going to be in different orientations from one play to the next, which is also a bit of a tweak on the um, older style, uh, like Navigador, Antique, Imperium, uh, Imperial, and um, those like that. Um, now, on that note, before I move on, I want to take a quick look at the chat. There's uh, quite a few people here, and uh, they might be asking questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody mentions Palaces of Carrara, uh, Craftwagon, <clears throat> Glenmore 2. Uh, has to be on this list, <laughs> so it says somebody. Um, there's also people mentioning Finca, Barrage, Red Cathedral. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, somebody mentioned Search uh, for Planet X, Teotihuacan. Yeah, lots of um, good options here, and I am going to talk about 18 more games, so we'll see how many of those actually make it on. Uh, let's see. Uh, Justin says, oh, this is an interesting because I thought it was all about staying on the rondelle to get more resources the longer you stay. Um, getting off... Uh, bringing your... Yeah, it, okay. Uh, I'll jump back into the comments in a little bit. But um, for now, I think let's uh, continue to move on to talk about some more games. And the next one is going to be Nova Luna. Now, um, the the through uh, from uh, the previous ones to this one right here is the fact that um, actually... Yeah, okay, well, either way, uh, <laughs> there isn't as much of a uh, follow-through of mechanics on this one than I thought. I've been working on this list for weeks, and I just finalized it very recently. But anyway, the thing about Nova Luna is that it has a neutral pawn, and um, this is the first game that I'm talking about today that has a neutral pawn. Um, on your turn, you're going to move this token forward uh, a number of spaces. I believe it's up to three, and then you're going to take the token where you land, and um, that token is a tile, and you'll put it into your own tile line area. Now, this right off the bat is a pretty big um, difference from the other games that I've talked about so far because um, the previous ones were all about action selection, you know, the different actions that you're doing. Whereas here on this rondelle that I'm calling it, um, these are tiles that you're taking that you're going to then place into your area. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier on, I'm taking a loose idea of rondelles. I'm not going super strict. I'm going to say um, some of these are much closer to the classical definition than others, but I still wanted to talk about how they um, are kind of different and similar at the same time. So coming back over to this, when you move this neutral pawn, it will be moved for the next player by definition. And so this brings in a new tension that you did not have in the previous two games that I talked about. Um, also, this game has a shrinking and um, a suddenly expanding rondelle, which is also quite interesting. The previous two games had a set in stone rondelle with those certain options, but in Nova Luna, as you take these tokens, that spot does not get refilled until almost all of these tokens are gone. So what that means is as more of the tokens go away, you are going to have less and less spots around the board, and you can spin around a lot faster, and your options will get lower and lower until suddenly you refill the whole board, and then you have a whole bunch of these options left on there. Um, and I thought that um, the way that this grows, uh, I guess, shrinks, and then snaps back was, was a pretty interesting take on um, how this circular action selection works. Uh, the next one is going to be New York Zoo. Uh, much like Nova Luna, this one has a neutral pawn. In this game, it's a big elephant. And um, in this game, you um, have a little bit of tile grabbing, actually quite a bit of tile grabbing, but you also have some other stuff going on. This is essentially a hybrid between Nova Luna and um, Sovereign Skies. Uh, in fact, I think in retrospect, I meant to swap those two to have a better follow through of the mechanics, but oh well, this is live. We're just going to do it. Uh, now, when you are taking your turn in New York Zoo, you move this neutral pawn. 
run uh, a number of spaces forward. And if you land on a stack of these tiles, then you are going to place that tile um, into your own zoo area. But if instead you land on one of these action spaces on the board, these blue action spots, you are going to generate those specific um, animals. So this is an interesting hybrid, again, where you have tile laying and you also specifically have action selection. Uh, so if people think that it has to be action selection for a rondelle, well, this one is definitely pushing those boundaries right there. Uh, now, in addition to that, um, I have what I essentially called universal events baked into this rondelle as well, because at certain points along this track, whenever you move that neutral pawn over them, there is going to be a breeding phase for that specific type of animal for everyone. So that means you have a neutral pawn, which of course will be in a new spot for your opponents when they take their turns in a clockwise order. And then you have the ability to take tiles or do actions, and you can force breedings to happen when they're better for you and not as good for your opponents. Um, you also um, can come back to um, what many believe to be a universal Universal tension for Rondell games, and that is how fast or slow do you go. And in this game, um, it's a neutral pawn, so obviously you only have some control over it, but you can go much slower with it, going uh, fewer steps if you want to stall out before a breeding happens to, so that you can set yourself up for it. Or maybe you just rush real quick to make sure a breeding happens because it's good for you and not for your opponents. And um, I personally think that's a, a pretty interesting hybrid. Um, uh, this game is all about making um, uh, you know a zoo in front of you with different animals, but when you really stare at this Rondell and think about it, it's got a lot of fascinating things going on and uh, interactions between all of these different mechanics. All right, the next game I'm going to discuss is Murano. Uh, by the way, let me know if I'm going a little bit too quickly. I have 20 games to talk about, and I, I have a lot of <laughs> different thoughts, and I'm trying not to go specifically on the games. I really just want to talk about what I see as the rondelle-type mechanics that are in these games. Uh, now, in Murano, we once again have a neutral uh, rondelle situation, uh, much in the way that New York Zoo and Nova Luna did. However, in uh, in Murano, you have multiple of these uh, uh, pawns. you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, actually. Uh, and there are boats that are going around this island. So all of these are neutral. They aren't associated with any one particular player. And um, when it's your turn, you're going to take one of these boats and you're going to move it counterclockwise um, as far as you want up until it bumps into another boat. Now, this game does have a bit of a pay more aspect to it because you can pay money in order to move other boats to get them out of the way so that you can move the actual boat that you want to get into the spot that you want to go to. Um, now, obviously, this game has eight different pawns, which is a huge jump up from the one that New York Zoo and Nova Luna had. Um, but much like those other two games, this uh, Rondell situation is all about um, capitalizing on opportunities that are available to you and also trying to make things harder for your opponents. In Nova Luna and uh, New York Zoo, if there's a great tile for an opponent, maybe you take it or you just jump past it so that on their turn, they can't get on their turn to kind of stall them out. And in this game, if there's a really great action that you want to do that you think your opponent wants to do, you could just go onto that spot. Uh, now, they could always pay um, one or maybe more money to move the boats out of the way to then do that action if they want. And uh, most of the actions around the board are duplicated. Some of them are just single ones, but there's still some uh, duplicate things going on out here. But I just love this um, this flow <laughs> around the board um, in many of the... Uh, uh, rondelle games, especially when you have your own specific pawn, um, you often don't interact with the other pawns. In this one, they're all neutral, but they definitely interact. They essentially block in with each other. And um, in many rondelle games, you can go a certain amount of spaces for free, and then you have to pay more. And this one says you can go as long as you want to within that specific gap before you pay more to make that gap bigger. Um, sometimes it might be just one position or two, or maybe it could be a whole ton of them, as these boats can tend to uh, have traffic jams around the outside of the map. So I uh, am really fascinated with this game. I've only played it once. Honestly, it was about a week ago. I played a two-player game, uh, and I would not mind playing this one more. I haven't even covered my impressions of this one just yet. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so coming back to this, uh, I don't think I have really anything else to say about Murano, but I think this is probably a good time to take a look at the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, people mentioned Shipyard. Uh, okay, I'm going to spoil it. Shipyard is definitely on this list. It'd be crazy for me to not put Shipyard on here. Um, somebody mentioned Sealand being an old game with a really interesting double rondelle. Um, I guess I'll spoil this uh, again and say that um, I... I didn't actually hear about that one. Uh, a great thing about researching uh, this video was that um, so many people threw so many different ideas at me. And I guess if I talked to uh, Devin Stoddard, um, they would have asked me about Sealand and I would have added that to the list to do some research on. So unfortunately, that one is not going to be showing up on here. All right, I think let's move on to the next game, and that is Scorpius Freighter. 
Uh, now, I kind of clustered these up in ways to try and have um, similar mechanics also with some differences, and I clustered in my notes New York Zoo, Murano, and Scorpius Freighter, because all of these have neutral pawns that you are going to be um, using. Uh, now, out here on the board for Scorpius Freighter, there are three rondelles in the middle, and each of these rondelles has a single token on it, and this is neutral. Now, a really interesting thing about Scorpius Freighter, um, well, beyond the fact that it has three rondelles compared to the one of everything that we've seen so far, is how these rondelles have been split up into different ways. Um, they have different sizes. Uh, this one over here has six spots on it, and the one at the very end has... Uh, oh, no, the one in the middle has... Actually, I thought there were different sizes. One, two, three... Oh, no, this one has five, and the, that one has uh, seven, and then... Six. Okay, well, either way. <laughs> um, but the leftmost rondelle in Scorpius Freighter um, is all about building up a Tai Lang engine on your ship. So um, on your turn, you can move this rondelle to add some tokens to your ship. The second one of these rondelles is all about running the engine that you built on your ship using that first rondelle. And the third rondelle is all about cashing out victory points for the stuff that you made when you ran your engine at the second rondelle, which again, you built by using the first rondelle. Now, uh, in this game, um, you actually have a card drawn driven rondelle uh, um, mechanic, and I forgot to put that in the image here. Um, each player has some cards in front of them, and in order to move on these rondelles, you have to essentially activate certain cards, which exhaust them until you've used all of them, and the number on those cards is going to dictate how far you can go around on here, and another really interesting thing is that the number of cards that you have um, not activated just yet will help you with the payout. So if you have these four cards and you use uh, two of them in order to move this uh, token around the rondelle a couple times, um, then the other two, the hands on them, will dictate how powerful an action you do there. So you have this push and pull of a card-based economy. It's always four cards, and once you use all four, they reset. Uh, but you have to think about the puzzle of how far do you want to go and how much do you want to do there. Because if you go slower, odds are good you can do more because you have less of the um, activated and exhausted crew members. Uh, so I personally love Scorpius Freighter. It's a really fascinating, cool game. But I also really like how um, those interactions work. Uh, again, this is a neutral uh, rondelle situation. So that means when you move these tokens, um, they will be moved for your opponents. So you can definitely get in each other's way. And um, in Scorpius Freighter, it has an interesting thing where the end game trigger is tied specifically to these neutral pawns that are in the middle of the board. Every time the pawn makes a full lap around, uh, you're going to have to put a resource cube down on top of it. And once a certain number of these spots on the uh, neutral pawn are filled in and a uh, on a certain number of the overall pawns, that will dictate the end of the game. So coming back to something I've mentioned a couple times, which is um, a, a central idea to a lot of rondelles being how fast or slow do you go? Well, in in this neutral rondelle situation, if you go really fast with those, um, first of all, you're probably going to have less effective turns because, as I said before, you have to use your crew to move, but you can push the end game. If you are in a situation where you think you're doing better than your opponents, you can really uh, go pedal to the metal and try to spin these uh, pawns around to push the game to come to a close. So now you not only have to think about how fast or slow do you want to go based off of your options and what your opponents want and the payout that you want to do, but you also have to think, how quickly do I want the game to end? If you have an awesome engine, but it hasn't quite caught up to somebody else, well, maybe you go smaller steps around the third rondelle, which gets you victory points instead of zipping around it really quickly because um, I, from memory, uh, I believe this is often the one that actually ends up triggering the end of the game. Uh, so yeah, a lot of really cool stuff going on in Scorpius Freighter. I haven't even talked about the tiling and engine building on the boards because that doesn't really have anything to do with rondelles. I can tell you, though, it's a really cool game, and just talking about it makes me want to play this one again. All right. The next game is Crown of Amara. Uh, now, the, the flow through from uh, Scorpius Freighter to Crown of Amara is the fact that um, this game also has multiple rondelles, has two of them in the middle of the table, and this game also has a card-driven rondelle movement uh, mechanism. Uh, now, unlike Scorpius Freighter, in uh, Crown of Amara, you have your own personal tokens. You have one of them on each of the two rondelles. Um, and um, in a similar kind of note, in Crown of Amara, one of these rondelles is going to get you stuff, and the other one is going to let you spend the stuff that you got from the first one in order to get victory points and do a wide variety of other things. So there's quite a bit of similarity there, but again, these do not have neutral pawns. These are pawns that you actually control yourself. Now, in Crown of Amara, um, on every turn, you're going to draw three cards, and you're going to have to essentially plan out 
where those cards are going to go on your own personal board. Um, the, one of the slots on your board has a one, another one has a two, and another one has a three. And when you place a card onto that spot, you're going to do the action that's printed on that card, and you're going to move one of your pawns on a rondelle a number of times equal to the number above that card. Now, I said you have three spots, and you always draw three cards from this random deck of nine. And what that means is at the start of each of the rounds, you have to plan out what you want to do. Does this card go over here to move you a couple times on that rondelle? And once that happens, you'll have the resources to play this card to activate that and move this one over there. It can be really puzzly, which is quite fascinating. And since they aren't neutral pawns, they are your own. That means, well, you know, you can definitely plan ahead in a lot of ways. You can't plan ahead for other things. People can take opportunities away from you in, in uh, very Euro-y style ways. But um, I just really like the way this card-driven uh, uh, mechanism works. Um, you are going to be moving essentially six times on the rondelles within each round. Uh, once is going to be a three move, one's a two, and one is a one. And you have to plan uh, for all of those. Um, again, going back to the thing I keep saying, um, in rondelles, you often can decide how fast you want to go. Well, in this one, it's a little bit more strict. Like, you're going to be going those six jumps uh, over the course of this, but you have to figure out how best to do that for yourself. All right. Next up, we have Viscounts of the West Kingdom. So um, we've, in my notes, we've essentially reached a new clustering of uh, uh, games that are somewhat similar. Uh, the first was Crown of Amara, then we have Viscounts of the West Kingdom, and then we have the third one, which I haven't talked about just yet. And um, the, the trick between this clustering right here is how the rondelle actually works, what drives that. Instead of just moving X amount, you have to do something else. Now, in Viscounts of the West Kingdom, there is a lot going on, but I'm going to be just specifically talking about the rondelle. But one other thing is deck building. In this game, you're going to be acquiring cards and putting them into your deck deck. And on each one of your turns, you're going to play a card from your hand, and the gold cost on that card is going to dictate how far you can move your specific pawn around the rondelle, which is the entire board. So that means as you are going through the game doing a variety of things, you are deck building, which means you are going to be adding new cards into your deck, and you'll oftentimes lose some as well. And then those cards that you get will dictate your movement opportunities. Now, another really interesting thing about the Viscounts of the West Kingdom rondelle is the fact that it has branching paths. I believe all of the rondelles that I've talked about up to this point have been a loop, you know, a big loop, a small loop, maybe multiple loops. But this one has a big loop where you can make decisions. Um, for instance, uh, there are little arrows coming out of uh, each of the different spots, and you might be able to go in towards the center, or you might want to stay around the outside. There's essentially, I guess, two rondelles. One is small and one is big going around the outside of it. And then there are lots of little paths that connect these two. So your single pawn can hang out around the outside and then jump into the inside and do specific actions that are related there. And this is a really cool take on uh, uh, varying your opportunities. You are still going clockwise around, so you still have that um, thing that you have to keep in mind, like when you pass over something and don't activate it, it's probably going to be a while till you can get back over there because now you are beyond it and you have to go all the way back around the board. Uh, but uh, much like uh, classic Rondell games, you can pay extra money to go farther, which definitely helps. And uh, in my couple of games of this one, there have been situations where I paid a bunch of money to zip around essentially the entire board. And um, again, that's kind of a classic Rondell thing which shows up in this game with a bunch of other tweaks. Um, the branching path is fascinating, and also just trying to figure out which card to play based off of how far you want to go is very cool. Also, the cards themselves do a lot more than just move your pawn around this uh, rondelle. Um, that is uh, only one factor, and you have to keep in mind all of the other things that are going on with your tableau, which I'm not showing because I don't want to go into those specifics. But I do think that Vi uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom brought in some very cool ideas uh, to the overall Rondell uh, uh, genre. Looking at the chat, uh, Andy mentions that Crown of Amara is a thinky game, and it also can be over before you know it. Yeah, I do remember that, uh, that it can end uh, uh, very fast, uh, surprisingly fast. Um, Ian mentions that um, they like how the rondelle in Viscounts complements the moving tableau card cycling. Uh, mechanics have a circular theme. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't um, specifically mention that. I'm not sure if this is exactly what you meant, but um, the cards that are here in the middle of the table can be acquired based off of where you have landed your pawn. Um, they can be uh, one-shot acquired or sometimes go into your deck, uh, and those opportunities are going to change. So there are pre-printed actions on the board, but then the cards in each one of these regions essentially shows a dynamic action that is going to be varying. And if you, you take that card, you might reveal an awesome card for your opponent, or maybe you take the card that they had an action that they really want to do, and then obviously they have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what they're going to do. All right. 
let's move on to the next game, which is Merlin. Uh, this is the third in uh, my grouping in my notes. Uh, and the reason this one is there is because you have a massive rondelle in the middle of the board and you move your tokens based off of dice. Um, the previous, I guess, three uh, things that I've talked about, uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom, Crown of Amara, and Scorpius Freighter all used cards uh, to a certain extent to move. Uh, but I felt like um, having dice dictate how you move was also uh, an interesting uh, flow through. Um, so in uh, Merlin, you are going to roll, I believe it's three dice of your color and then it's one neutral die. Um, don't quote me on that. It's been a while, but um, you're going to roll those dice at the beginning of the round. And then on each one of your turns, you're going to use one of those dice to move uh, the pawns. Now you have one pawn that is yours. And then there is a Merlin pawn, which is neutral. And on your turn, if you use the one white die that you rolled, then that lets you move Merlin. Uh, otherwise, if you use your dice, you have to move your own specific pawn. Now, uh, one interesting thing about the difference here is that your pawn, I believe, it's been a while, but I believe your pawn goes clockwise around this rondelle, whereas Merlin can go clockwise or counterclockwise. So that kind of brings us back to Sovereign Skies, which I talked about a while ago, where um, in this game, you sometimes have the option of going counterclockwise. And a counterclockwise movement is um, a pretty big... Uh, effect in a game where usually you go clockwise. Uh, a big part of rondelles is bypassing your opportunities, and if you bypass them and immediately turn around, well, you haven't really gone too far, and you can jump right back and do that. Uh, in uh, Sovereign Skies, which I talked about earlier, you could essentially keep changing your mind over and over again if you want to. I'm not sure if that's a good idea, but you could. And in this game, it's essentially a hybrid where your token must go clockwise, but that Merlin token is fascinating. Now, this game has an extra level of puzzliness and um, potential analysis paralysis in the fact that you can see the dice that everybody rolled. So that means if I am thinking about uh, moving Merlin, I can look to the person on my left and see, you know, maybe they haven't used their white die and that die shows a two. Well, if I move Merlin to that one spot, then they could use that two to go uh, onto that specific spot that they desperately need to go. So maybe I don't do that. I do something else to try and manipulate uh, the situation to a good spot. So you have both a neutral pawn and player-driven pawns. And I think this is the first one I've talked about today that hybridizes that as well. Um, and I just think that's fascinating. Also, this is one of the bigger rondelles that I've discussed so far. I guess Murano is a, a very large rondelle as well. Uh, but in this one, when you cross over a spot, it, it takes a while until you can get back over there. Um, now, it's been a while since I played this. I can't remember some of the specifics, but I know that there are ways to sometimes like jump all the way across the rondelle from one side to the other. Um, and there's definitely some shenanigans that you can get up to to pull off the uh, specific actions that you're trying to do. But, you know, this is just a rondelle puzzle of dice rolling uh, where the dice dictate how far you go. And <laughs> again, you look out to your opponents and see what options they have, and you can certainly play around that. All right, the next game is Crusaders Thy Will Be Done. Uh, now, this one uh, is all on its lonesome in my notes. I don't have this one grouped up with any others. Uh, and the biggest reason for that is because um, this is a Moncala style game. Uh, so what I mean by that is um, on your turn when you perform an action, you're going to take all of the tokens at one spot on a rondelle, and then you are going to drop them off one at a time until you run out of those tokens. This is um, a mechanic that is most famous in the game Moncala. And in Crusaders Thy Will Be Done, you are doing this, but um, specifically when you perform one of these actions, you will do that action based off of the number of tokens that are on that spot, and then you are going to move all of the tokens, kind of scattering them around the uh, uh, rondelle that you have in front of you. Usually you go clockwise, although one player can have an asymmetric benefit to make them go counterclockwise as well. Now, what that means is um, unlike many rondelle games, you can hypothetically do the same action multiple times if you have a big lump up, but oftentimes it doesn't happen. And a big part of many rondelles is is bypassing opportunities or doing something and then not really being able to do it again on the next turn because obviously you have to go around. And in this case, unless you have a ton of tokens on an action, if you pull all the tokens off and then drop them off one at a time, um, you're probably not going to have any tokens on that action spot again on your next turn. So you're probably going to do another action. And this has a fascinating effect where you are essentially incentivizing the actions that you don't do that often. Uh, because as you drop these in a clockwise pattern all the way around, you are going to be uh, building them up on the actions that you don't actually activate. Uh, so at a certain point, you might say, okay, I don't really need to do this action, but so many of the tokens are building up on it that I need, um, first of all, to just move them so I can get them onto the other actions that I want to do. And I guess the action I'm going to do there is pretty good because there's so much power there essentially already. Uh, now, another thing about Crusaders is I think 
for the first time in the game uh, in this list. Um, this is a personal rondel. Uh, you have your own little board in front of you, um, and um, specifically, I guess you have a ton of tokens. Each one of these can be considered a token, uh, but each player has their own one of these. Um, now, this is modular. Every time you play, you're going to shuffle all of these up, but um, each player is going to match their rondel to the one person who shuffled them up. So at the start of each game of Crusaders, you are going to have um, the same exact rondel in front of you as your opponents, but it will very likely be a different rondel than the previous time that you played it. Um, so that's pretty cool. And uh, you can actually differentiate in this game, which is neat as well. Um, each of the uh, pie slices in your rondelle can be flipped over, which upgrades them, which makes them more powerful. So that means as you go throughout the game, you will differentiate yourself compared to other players' rondelles. Even though the positioning is the same, how you upgrade these is going to really vary um, your options compared to your opponents, uh, specifically with the strategies that you are really pushing towards. Uh, now, one person mentioned in the chat uh, Trajan, uh, which is uh, a game that came out before Crusaders, and it is also a Mancala-style game, and it is not on this list. Um, the main reason is because I've never played it. I I've been wanting to for years, like like literally many, many years. I pulled it off the shelf at uh, game libraries a couple times, and it's just never happened. I would like to play Trajan at some point, uh, but I do know that um, Crusaders was actually a... Um, uh, was inspired by Trajan. Crusaders came out afterwards. Um, in Trajan, uh, you have this Moncala type thing going on, where you take all the tokens and then you drop them out, but the action that you activate is going to be the last spot where you drop a token. Uh, in Crusaders, instead, you do the action where you pull the tokens up, and then you drop these off. So, I imagine it's maybe a little bit harder to tell what your options are as you count things out in Trajan, whereas in Crusaders, you just instantly see, okay, that's how that works. In fact, uh, I believe the designer diary for Crusaders said that the designer of this game um, assumed that's how Trajan would work and then was surprised when it wasn't and said, okay, well, they're going to design a game using that essentially inverted Moncala style. Um, now, I guess I should come back all the way to the very beginning of the video where I mentioned that I'm using pretty loose definitions of uh, Rondell because, I don't know, I think it's fun. <laughs> I think it's more interesting to talk about these things. And for a long time, I was not going to put this on this list because I just kept saying, well, it's a Moncala game. It's not a Rondell game. And the more I thought about this, and man, I have thought about this so much, just hours of discussion and solo thinking about it. I took an hour-long dog walk yesterday. Uh, didn't listen to music or anything. I just thought about this list the entire time. And I, I just came to the, the realization that I didn't really want to exclude things from this list because of a technicality like that. Like, oh, it's more Moncala than Rondell. I figured, you know, it's got a Rondell vibe to it. You have a circular action selection system. Um, you uh, have some various interesting things going on, which differentiates this from another. And um, I just decided that was going to be the way I went. <laughs> um, so coming back to this one, uh, actually, I'm not really sure I have anything else to say specifically about Crusaders. Uh, I thought it did, but it just ran out of my mind. So maybe I'll talk about it again later. All right, let's move on to the next game. And that one is Shipyard. <laughs> so this one uh, uh, was mentioned a couple times in the chat already. Um, yes, uh, I did put Shipyard on the list. And in fact, this is one of the games that I played over the last month um, as essentially homework slash research. I mean, you know, twist my arm, <laughs> play this game from a designer that you love uh, that you've never gotten around to uh, just for a video. Like, okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> now in Shipyard, uh, there are a bunch of rondelles going on. And um, I'm going to start with the, the boring ones first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, the first one is, uh, the first, I guess, uh, four or so, is the fact that on the right-hand side of the board, you have uh, rondelles nested in each other. There's a green one and then a tan one around the outside. There's a blue rondelle underneath that. And then over to the side, there is this kind of brownish rondelle. And all three of these have uh, neutral tokens on them that move clockwise. And when you activate actions to move those rondelles, you can spend currency to go farther. So all uh, four of these are very traditional rondelles, but I don't actually want to talk about those. Instead, I want to talk about the main action selection part of the board, um, which is much more different <laughs> than your standard rondelle situation. Now, in this game, you have a series of action tiles that are uh, on essentially a looped track. Uh, most of the track or rondelle is empty in this case, so to a certain extent, it almost seems like it's a line, but it does spin around. Uh, now, in this game, you have your own specific pawn, and on your turn, you're going to move your pawn along with the action token that you have on it all the way to the front, and then you have to move your pawn 
uh, counterclockwise um, onto a spot that is empty. So that means you can go onto any of these, th those are your options. And that also means that this game has blocking of actions, which is something that I haven't really talked about so far. In general, rondelle mechanics are uh, nice to a certain extent. Like you can, if you have your own personal rondelle, there's usually no benefit or um, a penalty for going onto the same spot as somebody else. And um, if it's a neutral pawn, I guess the penalty uh, uh, interaction with your opponents is just moving it to spots where they don't really like it. In this game, though, um, first of all, you cannot do the same action again because you have to leave it to go on to something else. So that kind of leans into some of the Rondell ideas. Um, uh, and in addition to that, when you go on an action, that means your opponents also can't go on that action. Now, when you jump off of it, that's going to free that action up for the next player. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. And, um, you know, as you are deciding which of these actions that you want to go to, you can go um, quite far or not as far. It's just kind of up to you what actions you specifically want to do. The farther back you go, the more benefits you'll get. You'll actually gain currency for the number of pawns in front of you. So that's kind of interesting because there is an incentivization mechanic baked in here because that means when when somebody isn't activating a token, it's going to be left behind and fall farther and farther back. And once you finally go there, odds are good other people are in front of you so you can get some money um, as a bonus for that action essentially lagging behind. Now, when it comes to rondelles, this is, you know, a big gray area. <laughs> I think many, many people would argue that this is not, but I still think that is a fascinating action selection system that is, uh, I guess it's, it really isn't circular the more I think about it. <laughs> It really is essentially, you know, a, a, an inchworm uh, crawling around a circular track. So you see the circle out here, but uh, either way, I, I still think that that is a fascinating thing. And that is going to lead me into the next game on this list, uh, which I, for the long time, almost didn't put on this list. And that one is Craft Wagon. Uh, so this one was mentioned by uh, a few people in the chat already. Uh, and I played this one years ago. And for a while, this has been off the list, honestly, until yesterday when I had that dog walk and I decided, you know what? I want to talk about Craft Wagon. I want to talk about, um, you know, some other things that I haven't talked about yet, some of the a little bit more out there uh, options. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about Craft Wagon. Now, the big uh, flow through here is the fact that you have a action track in the middle of the board and it has a similar feel to Shipyard, but it's actually pretty different. Um, the first thing is that this is a time track style game uh, compared to uh, Shipyard where you just take your turns in clockwise order. So what that means in Craft Wagon is that the token that is farthest back on this loop is going to take their turn. Uh, now, when you take your turn, you can go as far forward as you want to, but if you go too far forward, it might be a while until it's your turn again, because again, you only take your turn once everyone else's pawn has gone past yours. Now, in this game, this uh, looped track is a set of actions. Each one of these tokens is an action. And when you take that action, you bump it essentially to the front of the line, which means um, it's farther away. And that means if somebody else wants to do that action, they have to go farther along the track. So it's essentially a disincentivization system, which is certainly fascinating. Uh, now, much like the shipyard action selection that I just talked about, you could also see this as being a bit of a line, but I guess every loop to a certain extent could be split. Now, in this game, uh, you are going to be... Sorry, I just lost my train of thought here. Um... So yeah, the, the, the big difference here is the time track that's going on and I guess the dynamic nature of how this rondelle works. Um, each of the action spots is going to be mixed up differently as people uh, take these tokens, knock them out and put different ones down. And a similar thing is happening in Shipyard. And for the most part, most of the rondelles that I've talked about so far are fixed. Um, so that's, you know, probably uh, another notch against this being, you know, a classic rondelle. And of course, this is not a classic rondelle. But, you know, if every game that was a rondelle game use the same exact uh, uh, pie wedge, move three spaces for free and more spaces for money uh, type of thing, then the games probably would be nowhere near as interesting. Uh, now, I do want to mention at this point that um, Glenmore is not on this list. Uh, I did consider it. Um, Glenmore uh, came from the same designer. It has a, a similar action selection system, but you're taking tiles and putting them into your area. Um, I could have talked about it, but I figured 20 games was enough. <laughs> That's a lot of games to discuss. All right, let's move on to the next game, and that one is Walnut Grove. Uh, now, this one has uh, the flow through from Craft Wagon in that um, you have a uh, uh, 
you have a time track system going on in the middle of the table. Um, there is a tiling part of this game. There's actually quite a bit of cool stuff going on with Walnut Grove, but specifically talking about the rondelle here in the middle of the table, you have this track going all the way around. And um, at the start of each round, you are going to move your pawn uh, clockwise and the players go in reverse order based off of how far they are away from a specific spot. So your ordering on this track is going to dictate the player order, which is a similar vibe to things like Craft Wagon. Uh, however, in this game, it is round-based, like everyone does one thing, and then you go and do something else, like tile laying and producing stuff, and then you end up coming back over here and moving again. Uh, now, a big part of this game is actually blocking. Um, this almost has a worker placement vibe to it, because you have this one pawn, and while you are on a spot, no one else can go there. <laughs> and so what that means is if you go really far forward onto a spot and do that action, well, you're going to be blocking it not only for the people... Um, after you in the specific round, but in the next round of the game, um, it's going to be blocked until you move. <laughs> and if you go really far forward, it's going to be a while until it is your turn. And um, I've only played this game once, but there were so many times where people were just very upset that somebody had still not moved their pawn yet based off of how the uh, uh, player order worked. Now, another interesting thing about this game is the fact that um, you can go effectively as far forward as you want to, but there are penalties that you have to pay um, at two places on the map. When you pass these specific spots, you have to pay a coin. So it's essentially free to move as far as you want until you get to one of these spots, and then you have to pay a coin if you want to go farther. Now, there's a fascinating thing going on in this game where the coins if I remember correctly, are worth points, but they are random. When you gain coins, you take them out of a bag, and those coins might have a zero, a one, or a two on them, which means if you pick up a zero coin, you might be upset because that means you're not getting points, but you can still spend it to go around this track. Uh, 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 the opposite version of that, of course, is if you draw a two coin, well, that feels really bad. You don't want to pay that coin when you cross over the spot. So you might go really slow trying to find another coin, maybe a one, or maybe you end up drawing a zero to spend that one, as you can hoard that too, because you want to hold on to it for end game victory points, which I think is a pretty uh, fascinating idea. Uh, so the tension around this rondelle uh, was very real as people were taking uh, spots and blocking them. And that economy of trying to figure out when you want to spend coins uh, was a, a very interesting thing. I mean, if all of your coins are twos, that might seem great because that means you got lucky and, you know, you pulled all these victory points out of the bag and they could have been zeros, but you might feel really hampered with the options that you have to take. And at some point, you're just going to have to spend those twos, losing those points, uh, sending them back to the bag. So they may as well have been zeros in that case. It's a fascinating system. All right, let's move on. Uh, the next game is Heaven and Ale. Uh, now, this one I have grouped up with Walnut Grove uh, because, um, well, blocking and uh, the round-based uh, uh, situation that's happening in this game. Uh, actually, nope, I just... Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> lost track. I have a list of 20 notes and I, I got lost track. Uh, so yeah, specifically Heaven and Ale. Uh, let's talk about how this rondelle works. Uh, now, in the middle of the table... You have a board. Oh, my goodness. There we go. You have a board, and it's a circular track. And um, you have... It feels like a time track kind of game, but it isn't because you are going to take turns in clockwise order going around the table. But when you take your turn, you're going to move your pawn forward as far as you want to. So it has that time track vibe to it where go far as far forward as you want to. Uh, but of course, if you go really far forward, then it's going to be a while till you take your next turn. Well, that's not the case in Heaven and Ale because you just go clockwise around the table. So that means you might go really far forward on the track and then a couple people take their turn and suddenly it's your turn again, even though you're way up here. And this makes some fascinating uh, 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 situations around the table with the players because when you take your turn, you're going to go onto these spots and activate the actions and take these various tokens. So you have a blocking aspect to it because if you go there, you take the thing and other people can't take the thing after it's gone. But it also has a situation where if somebody jumps really far forward, maybe like two thirds around the table and everybody else is going slowly, well, that person who jumped really far forward kind of has impunity to just grab those other different things. So let's say it's a three-player game and somebody goes really far forward and the second player says, oh, I don't want them to have free reign and all that later stuff. I'm going to move really far forward too. Well, that third person is way at the back and now they have no reason not to go really slowly grabbing everything as they go. So you have this situation where sometimes you really do want to jump really far forward and it can make some uh, really interesting uh, situations where the players are trying to figure out, well, you know, do I catch back up to that person and, and help the other person? Uh, which one of these things do I do? And it's definitely something that you have to keep in mind. 
Uh, now, another aspect to this game um, that uh, lines up with Walnut Grove a little bit, as well as the next game I'll be talking about, is the fact that it is built in rounds. Uh, now, specifically for Heaven and Ale and the next game, um, you are going to be going around this track, but once you reach the end, that is essentially the end for you in, in Heaven and Ale specifically. Uh, you are not going to take more turns, and there is actually an incentive for going around quickly. Um, the sooner you reach the very end of this loop, you are going to get be um, uh, better benefits. Now, once everybody makes it all the way around, you are going to finish the round and then start a new one where you go once again around this track. And because of that, for a while, I didn't have this one on my list of rondelles because I felt like that was too far different from a, your traditional rondelle where you just keep going and there's no real start and stop point. Uh, but, you know, again, I decided to loosen things up a little bit so that I could talk about some of these uh, differences and similarities. And, um, you know, the fact that you have to consider that as you are going around, I found personally quite fascinating. Uh, all right, the next game is Maracaibo. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Great Western Trail is not on this list. Um, I know that Maracaibo and Great Western Trail are different, but for the purposes of this list, I decided to go with Maracaibo because uh, both of those games have a large uh, rondelle. Essentially, the entire board is a rondelle, and players are going to be traveling around it. Now, um, specifically... <laughs> Here I am talking about Great Western Trail, even though I said I wasn't going to. Um, in that one, there is kind of an end to the loop, uh, but players aren't necessarily stuck in the same round. Uh, but in Maracaibo, you are in a round-based situation, uh, somewhat similar to Heaven Ale, with a very big exception. Uh, now, before I talk about that exception, let's talk about how you go around this rondelle. Um, now, you start in Havana, and you're going to be moving your ships forward. And it's been a little while since I played. You can move your ship a certain number of spaces forward. I can't remember the exact range, but it has a really interesting push-pull dynamic because the uh, farther you go, um, the more actions you get to take. Oh my gosh, it's been so long. I did so much research and I'm trying to remember if it's more or less. But <laughs> either way, let's be a little more abstract and say the distance that you travel will dictate the uh, potency of some of the actions that you decide to stop on, which is interesting because you might want to go slower to adjust that or you might really want to go faster in order to adjust that. Now, Maracaibo has a branching path situation, um, which is, you know, somewhat similar to Viscounts of the West Kingdom that I talked about earlier. There are many spots where you can decide to go left or to go right, and that will uh, vary the options that you have available to you. Uh, also, in this game, you have some modularity uh, from one game to the next, where you shuffle up these tiles and put them onto specific spots. So the options that you can perform as you are going around are going to be different. Now, the big exception that I wanted to mention about Maracaibo compared to Heaven and Ale, which is why this is on here, is the fact that once somebody makes it all the way around to the end of this uh, loop, that is going to trigger the end of the game. In Heaven and Ale, you can keep taking actions, even if somebody is all the way at the end. But in Maracaibo, uh, somebody might say, and I'm going to rush all the way to the end. And suddenly everybody else around the table says, wait, what? I thought I was going to get two or three more turns. So that is a massive impact that is going to change uh, the, the, specifically the group thing <laughs> at this table, you have to pay attention to what your opponents are doing, not just because what options are available to you, but you have to try and get a read on how fast are they going. If Are they a speedboat ripping around the Caribbean? Well, if that's the case, then you better plan accordingly. Like if your plan involves you stopping here and then stopping there to then cash out for a really big benefit there, but you had to end your turn way back here because the round ended early, well, you're going to be in a bad situation. So uh, I thought that was a pretty fascinating tweak, and that's the main reason I decided to add that one to this list. The idea that um, they, are, they aren't neutral pawns, they're all individual player pawns, but um, you can still have a massive impact on what your opponent's options are, and specifically how much they can do uh, based off of that. Uh, that does mean that Morikaibo can have uh, very different game lengths. Uh, if everybody, uh, if one person is going quickly, then the game can be relatively quick. But if everybody decides to kind of uh, tool along doing all sorts of things, this game can be very long. It kind of depends on the group situation. All right, the next game is Teotihuacan City of the Gods. Uh, now, this one uh, has, let's see here, uh, it is modular. Um, it's maybe more modular than Maracaibo, but uh, it definitely has different setups every time you play. Specifically with this one, there are these large action tiles, and you um, shuffle them up and you place them out onto these spots at the start of the game, and then players are going to be going around this loop in a clockwise manner. Now, in this game, you have... 
um, you have uh, dice, but you don't actually roll them. Uh, they are essentially counters, and they are your pawns that you're going to be moving around. Um, so no neutral pawns going on in this game. Uh, now, when you uh, take your turn, you're going to choose one of your dice, and you can move it around the board. I believe it was one to three different spots. And then where you land, first of all, you are potentially going to have to pay a penalty of uh, the cocoa resource, depending on the number of um, dice that are already on that spot. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, there is essentially a... Uh, penalization for clustering up, but there's also a big bonus for clustering up specifically with your own dice, because after you land on a spot, the uh, intensity of that action for the most part is going to be increased for the number of your pawns slash dice that are on that specific spot. So you definitely feel a push towards clustering. Like you go onto the spot with one of your uh, uh, dice workers, then you do the action. Then you bring another one around and you land on the same spot to do an even bigger action. And then you pull your third one around and do a massive action on that spot but now all of your uh, dice are on the same exact location. So that means the more you're clustering, the bigger um, the payout you have for those actions, but also the less options that you have for your future movements. So you can have um, uh, big setups trying to pull all these things together and then find yourself saying, okay, well, <laughs> I guess everybody's over here now, so it's going to take a while till we get back over there, and you essentially go into a next phase. Um, now, a really cool thing about this game is the fact that you are going to be upgrading your workers as you uh, go. I said they are dice, but you don't roll them, because as you activate these actions, you are going to be increasing the pip value on um, one or more of the dice, depending on the spot you go to. So as you use dice more, they will have larger values on them, and the value is also going to dictate how powerful they are uh, with the specific actions that you perform. So that is fascinating. You have upgradable uh, workers that you are trying to cluster in order to have really big payouts. And um, if you use that worker too much, though, <laughs> if you take it up to the sixth spot, they ascend. You essentially lose that worker. You score some victory points and get some pretty good bonuses. Ascending is not a bad thing. And then you get a new apprentice worker that uh, plops out onto the board uh, at a level one. So <laughs> that's definitely going to change the intensity of the options that you have uh, as you are going around. So the modularity here is fascinating, although, you know, somewhat similar to other games. But the clustering is really a big aspect to it. And with clustering in mind, we can now move on to Finca. Uh, now, Finca was, I think, the first game that I thought of when uh, I found out that um, this video was happening. It was, you know, way back when it was going to be a top 10 list of uh, Rondell games. And I was like, well, Finca is obviously going to be on that list because Finca is amazing. <laughs> it's a really, really good game. In fact, the photo uh, right here was taken uh, just about a week ago. Uh, I played this one over, you know, the last decade or so, just a ton of times. Now, why I'm talking about it here at this specific point in the video is because of clustering. Now, if we look at the main board, there is this windmill. Uh, I guess it also has modularity too, because at the start of each game, you're going to shuffle up all of these um, sail fin type things on the windmill and you put them out um, uh, randomly. So that means each time you play the game, the clustering, or I guess the... Uh, um, the way these layout is going to be different. Um, now, in this game, you have your own specific pawns, and you have multiple pawns on this specific rondelle. Uh, the number that you have is going to vary with the player count. And on your turn, you are going to have to move one of your farmers, and you're going to send them clockwise around this rondelle. Now, this is where the game gets super interesting because it's all about clustering. And remember, I mentioned clustering a bit with Teotihuacan, and that led me into the big cluster game of Finca because the number of spaces you move your farmer is equal to the number of farmers on that space before you move them. So that means if there are three farmers on a spot and you decide to move one of them, you will have to move that farmer three spaces around this uh, uh, clockwise uh, rondelle. Now, after that, we are not done with clustering because you will then gain a number of resources uh, based off of that specific fin type uh, equal to the number of farmers that are now on that spot. So if you move three spots and then that's the only farmer on that location, well, then you just get one of that thing. But if you are able to work yourself into a situation where you land on a spot and you're maybe the fourth of the farmers, it doesn't matter whose color they are, just fourth farmer period, then you take four of that specific resource, which, you know, is a lot more than one. <laughs> Now, uh, to counterbalance that, because you obviously do want to get lots of these resources, there is a limited market. Uh, now, technically, I've only played with this limited market once. Uh, I played this game a whole bunch, and the original rules for the game had all of the resources in the supply, no matter what the player count was. And there was always a rule where if you go to take a resource from the supply and there aren't any there, then everybody loses all of that resource. All of it goes back into the supply, and then you take as much as you want. Uh, so that rule's always been there. But at lower player counts, that happened less often because there was a bunch of these resources. Now, apparently, in the reprint of Finca that came out like three or four years ago, 
there was an added um, setup rule where you put less of these resources in the supply uh, with the player count. So when I played this um, just a week or so ago, it was a two-player game, and it was the first time I ever played it with these restricted resource supplies for a two-player game. And that was really interesting. We lost uh, resources a couple of times because you are penalized for hoarding. If you are hoarding too much of a resource, your opponent might find themselves in a situation, which did happen in our game, where they land on a spot to get like three or four of a resource that they don't even need because that is enough to cause you, the, their opponent, to dump all of their resources into the middle. And the fact that they have those now, they can maybe use those for something else, but they can definitely use that as kind of an aggressive way to penalize people from hoarding. So that was a bit of a tangent. <laughs> Didn't really have uh, as much to do with the rondelle, but I guess it does um, flow through from the clustering idea. Uh, so yeah, it's just a fascinating situation. Obviously, if you have more players, there's going to be more um, uh, different colored uh, pawns out here on the market, but or on the rondelle, but um, there will be less of each player's specific spot. Uh, so this is a pretty tactical game. Uh, the situation can change a lot from one person's turn to the next. You might be trying to set yourself up to go, you know, three specific spots onto that location to get three of that specific thing to cash it out for uh, something else. And then, you know, your opponent moves off that spot and suddenly, well, now you only move two and then your entire plan is gone. So fortunately there are ways to kind of get around that with some special actions, which I won't talk about, but Finca is a brilliant game. It's, it's such a pristine, elegant system. And uh, I definitely think this one uh, deserves to be on uh, any Rondell list for sure. All right, let's now move on to the next game, which is Red Cathedral. Uh, now I have this one um, in the same kind of area as Finca because it also has clustering in a slightly different way. Now, Red Cathedral, uh, specifically when it comes to the actions that you take, um, it's not a Rondell action game. It's actually a Rondell market, uh, which is a reason why I had this off the list for a while until I said, you know, I'm going to put it on there uh, because I want to talk about it. So on your turn, you're going to choose an action. And one of those actions lets you interact with this circular Rondell-esque market in the middle of the board. Now on this uh, market, there are dice that are placed there. And um, much like Teotihuacan, in this game, you're not rolling these dice. Those dice are effectively, um, actually, no, I take it back. You do roll these. Oh my gosh, it's been a while, but either way, Forget I said all that. Coming back to this market, when you activate the market, you are going to move one of these dice and you're going to move it a number of spaces forward equal to the value on it. So it is a counter, but you do roll it later on. So if there is a blue two, then you're going to move that two chunks forward clockwise around this rondelle. And then you are going to perform actions based off of the spot where you land. It might be getting you resources. It might be performing actions. It could do all sorts of things. And the reason I'm talking about it here is because there is clustering as an option. The number of dice on that spot where you land the new die is going to dictate the power of that specific action. So um, this is a neutral market. All of these dice are neutral. Nobody is specifically uh, uh, in control of one of them in particular. And you can try to set yourself up to have big moments uh, at this market uh, as these dice cluster. If somebody puts a second die into a spot to uh, double activate, then other people are very incentivized to try and put a third die into that spot to do a triple activation, which is the most. Uh, now, after you do activate one of these buckets, you re-roll all the dice. That's why I was kind of wrong earlier, but then you re-roll them and you put them down and then the values on those dice are going to dictate how far they're going to go next time they're activated. So I thought that was pretty cool. Also, I did say that these are neutral dice, but that was mostly right. <laughs> uh, out here on the board, there is one die that is uh, white and then all of the other dice are uh, the same color as one of the players. And when you do this market action, if you choose to move the white die or the die that matches your color, which technically is neutral, but it does match your color, uh, then you can spend resources, I think uh, coins, in order to move those dice farther. So if you take a die that does not match your color and it's not white, then you don't have any uh, flexibility. You have to move it the exact amount of stuff. But uh, one of them is slightly more uh, affiliated with you. Again, it doesn't really feel like yours because other people can move it and they frequently will, but you have a little bit more flexibility to go onto specific spots to activate those really big clusters by spending a coin or two to, to pull those things off. Okay, at this point, I've talked about 18 games, and I did say I was going to talk about 20. And with that in mind, I'm now going to move into the last two. And the reason I'm making a preamble here is because these last two, they're weird. <laughs> they, they, they don't necessarily belong on this list, but I wanted to talk about them. I wanted to uh, think about them from the uh, framework of rondelles. Um, I don't think anyone would call either of these rondel games, but... You know what? They have rondelle type things going on there. And the first of those two weird ones is Maduras. Uh, now, this one actually just came up last night. I was chatting about this with my wife, Jessica, and she asked about it. And I was like, 
Holy cow, Maduris, that's right. Uh, so in this game, uh, you have a big board in the middle of the table. And in the middle, there is uh, some resource spots and you have different workers that are in your color and um, you can move them around to get resources. They don't follow any sort of path. There really isn't a rondelle with your actions. Instead, there is a circle around the outside of the board and a druid who is neutral. And this druid is going to go clockwise around this track as the game goes on. Now, you control when the druid moves, but you don't control how far they move. They, they go a, spe uh, a specific set of movements. And what that means is, um, well, let's talk a little bit more about this track before I go into the, uh, the details. So as you're playing this game, you're gonna be gathering resources and then using those to build little houses on spots around this outside ring. Now, every time you place a new house onto the board, the druid is going to move clockwise until they reach a new clustering of houses, which is just a set of houses that are all adjacent to each other. When the druid arrives at one of these sets of houses, everyone who has a house in that set has the option of um, uh, uh, doing a sacrifice, a donation, a gift, an offering. There it is. I think it's an offering. <laughs> an offering to the druid. If you don't do an offering, you actually lose a victory point. If you do a half offering, you get a point. And if you do a full offering, which is two resources, you get victory points equal to the number of houses in that cluster. So if there's a cluster of five houses and you spend one resource, you just get one. Or if you spend two, you get five victory points, which is a massive jump going from one resource to two. Uh, now, the resources that you have to spend are printed on the board specifically. Uh, but again, the druid is only going to move when a new house is built. So that means on your turn, if you want to build a house, you have to think about the fact that that's going to force the druid to move. And maybe this is great, or maybe this is terrible. If you're about to build a house right in front of the druid, it will move onto that house. And if you don't have enough resources to put up an offering, then you're going to lose a victory point, which certainly seems bad. But maybe you build a house right behind the druid and it moves forward into a clustering and you can look across the table and see that your opponents are not set up to have the offering tokens they need. And then they either lose points or maybe they only get one point for that offering when they could have gotten six or seven if it's a massive clustering near the end of the game and um, pushing the druid at the right time for when it's good for you and also not pushing the druid or not getting in front of the druid at the right time when you're not ready to give offerings is the game. It, it, that's really what's going on here. Uh, now, as I said, uh, this pawn is neutral. It always goes a number of spaces forward until it reaches a new cluster of these houses. So from a Rondell perspective, you don't have the ability to make it go farther. It's not yours, uh, and it only moves when another uh, specific action happens. But I really feel like that has a, a Rondell vibe to it. I'm um, sure it's, it's you know, essentially a... a <laughs> an event track to a certain extent. I mean, uh, for so many of these, you can come up with other specific definitions, but uh, I think that this game is fascinating. And I think it really is all about that circular track. Um, obviously, if you build a house right in front of that druid, then they are going to move there or maybe get there soon. And then if you have the resources, you can pay those to get the victory points. And that means you essentially... <laughs> If you build close, you might be able to get more points for that house before the game ends because the druid's only going to go around a certain number of times. So if you go far away, kind of playing it safe, um, it's possible that that house will score one less time before the end of the game and the uh, scores can be very tight in this one. So uh, that is why I think Maduris uh, deserves to be uh, discussed on this list. Uh, it's a really funky game. Uh, honestly, uh, I played it a couple times, and every time I played it, um, multiple people around the table have said, this does not feel like anything else that I've played before. Uh, so I think that's part of why I wanted to uh, uh, talk about it here, because to a certain extent, it, it's, it's very new. It feels very fresh in a lot of ways, but it does have some affinities to some other more standard things, in this case, like rondelles. Uh, okay, at this point, we've reached the final game I'm going to be talking about today. And I have to be honest, I'm surprised somebody mentioned this in the chat already. Uh, that is Barrage. <laughs> uh, now, in one of the many conversations that I had uh, with friends about this game, uh, one, of, in one of those conversations, a friend uh, said, what do you think about Barrage? And they asked me in a very tongue-in-cheek way. Uh, honestly, it seemed like they, they expected me to say no, but they, they also expected me to think about it for a bit and be like, you know, caught off guard. And I certainly was. My first reaction was, what? That doesn't make sense. Uh, but, you know, before I even go into that, let's talk about the rondelle that is in Barrage, and then we'll talk about why I'm actually going to be having it here on the list. Uh, now, there's a lot going on in Barrage. There's a huge worker placement board. There is a massive uh, water flow, uh, hydroelectricity system going on in the game, and I don't want to talk about any of that stuff. I want to talk about this wheel that is right here in front of the players. This is is why the game exists. And I desperately want to play a game that uses this and maybe a simpler situation with not so many other things going on. So 
on your turn, uh, when you are going to be uh, using this wheel, you are going to be choosing an action token. You have some of them in front of you, and you're going to be placing that into the top of this wheel. In addition to that, when you do these actions, you're going to spend uh, resources, uh, excavators and um, trucks and that kind of thing, uh, but you don't send them back to the supply. Instead, you also put them into that specific pie wedge. Now, after you do that, you're going to perform the action, and then you are going to spin this wheel around. What that means is all of the resources that you used to make that and the action token that you just used to perform that action are trapped. They are stuck on this water wheel, and you don't get access to them until they go all the way around and they fall out the top. So obviously, when you do this action, if you rotate it and there were resources and an action token that were now pushed into the very top, then these will be freed. You can add them to your supply and then you can use those in the future. So coming back to the original idea of rondelles, uh, you know, you have your pie shaped wheel and you can go three spaces forward and you can spend currency to go farther. A big aspect to that is, you know, not only the speed at which you're trying to go around it, but also the idea that you can't do the same action uh, one turn after another. Uh, also, uh, in, in those situations, if you bypass an action, it's hard to get back to it. That doesn't really apply here to Barrage. But what does apply is the idea that once you do that action to build that dam or that hydroelectric plant, that action token is locked. Uh, now, if memory serves, there are ways to get more of these action tokens so you can potentially do it more times. But there are also action uh, work placement spots that you can go to and various benefits that will spin this wheel faster. So it's going to move once every time you use it, but there are other ways to spin it quick. And, you know, coming back to rondelles, sometimes you want to go slow, sometimes you want to go fast. In Barrage, you essentially always want to go fast. You, you want to get these resources back as soon as possible. There's, there's no world where you say, I'm going to slow roll going around on this wheel. But I just think the way these are locked out, essentially like a cooldown, is, is, is kind of similar to a rondelle type of situation. Obviously, when you're choosing an action from the ones in front of you, that's just a pile of tokens that you can take. But as soon as you choose that and you slap it into this uh, lockout wheel, it's going to be stuck there. And, and there is a defined order there as well. You can see the actions that you took, the specific order that you took, and the resources that you spent because they are stuck there on the wheel. And once it rolls out, you can start to gain access to them again, which means, you know, maybe if you really wanted to do that action, you use it again immediately, which means to a certain extent, these can have a, a pretty big impact on the order in which you take your actions based off of the order that you took them previously. So it's kind of a dynamic, free-flowing, pseudo-Rondell situation. I don't know. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, I think I do want to talk about that here on this list. Uh, so yeah, that is 20 games. <laughs> um, I... I hope people enjoyed this. Uh, the, the scope of this video was different than expected. As I mentioned at the very beginning, um, this was supposed to be a top 10 list for Rondell games. Uh, and I, at the very beginning of this month, when I first realized that was what was going to happen, I, I made a list of games that I'd never gotten around to that I wanted to play, like Navigador and Shipyard um, and others. Uh, some got added on as I went, like Murano was kind of a last minute addition. And when I actually sat down to make the list after doing the research to play these things and figure out what I wanted to do, it just seemed kind of silly to, to rank them. And I'm not saying that I couldn't do it, and I'm not saying that other people who have shouldn't have, but, you know, when you're thinking about ranking them, if it's a Rondell top 10 list, well, you should probably really focus on the Rondell itself. And the more I focused on the Rondell itself and the more I thought about how one Rondell reacts to the other, the more I thought, you know, the ordering of these isn't what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is how they're similar and how they're different. And once I started building a spreadsheet and like kind of plunking in the different attributes, like this one has neutral tokens, this one has multiple rondelles, this one has, you know, clustering. And I kind of realized that, you know, there are some similarities here. And obviously the order in which I just went through, um, it wasn't arbitrary. Uh, it certainly wasn't um, uh, based off of year of publication or uh, uh, my personal interest in it specifically. But I did think it was interesting to flow from one thing to next and realize that, you know, Game A is kind of like game Z and kind of like game B and game B is kind of like A and C. And, and it was interesting to kind of flow around. Some of the connections were a little stronger than others, but yeah, that is why I changed the scope of this one. And also <laughs> when I realized I wanted to change the scope and just talk about this, uh, I looked at this list and I was like, there's no way I'm going to get this to 10 games. I have so many things I want to talk about. Some of these things are uh, different from others in big or small ways. Um, and I... <laughs> I am a mechanics geek. Uh, if you've paid attention to me, watch my uh, channel for, for any amount of time, you'll probably know that 
you know, I'm not theme oriented. I am all about the mechanics and I can talk forever about specific mechanics. So realizing I have the opportunity to just geek out about specific things that are Rondell-esque. Is this a Rondell? Is it not? And also how they are different and similar. Uh, that seemed like a video that I wanted to make. And I think that is going to essentially bring this to a close. Uh, let me take a quick look here at the chat. I've been trying to keep an eye on it <laughs> as this has been going on because, um, you know, people are asking questions and whatnot. Um, for the most part, uh, people have just been offering up certain suggestions, and I think uh, that's uh, great. I'm really glad. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody mentioned that they forgot about Maduras, and I did too. I was so excited, honestly, when Jessica mentioned Maduras because I was like, that seems like a fascinating one to discuss. Uh, let's see. Well, I think there isn't... Oh, here we go. Um, John, uh, somebody asked, John, I wonder if you have tried Merlin plus the King Arthur expansion. Three interlocking rondelles make that game AP heavy and way better than the base only game. Uh, I haven't. Uh, technically, I have only played Merlin once, and I almost don't even count that because we played a very significant rule wrong. We had the rondelle correct, but there's this whole like countryside thing, and we had the, the payments for it very, very wrong. I've been meaning to get her back around to it. I still own a copy of it, um, so I would like to try it. Um, I rarely find myself running towards expansion, so I think odds are somewhat unlikely that I'll find myself uh, playing it with the expansion, but you never know. It's interesting to hear that it's got three interlocking rondelles when the uh, base game only has one. I guess they said, this game does not have enough rondelles. Let's throw a bunch of them at it. <laughs> um, Alvin uh, says, great list despite not seeing Palaces of Carrara on it. Uh, fortunately, that game is getting a reprint at the end of the year. Um, much like Sealand that was mentioned earlier on in the chat, uh, that did not pop up on my research list. Uh, I've not played Palaces of Carrara, uh, and I should look into it. <laughs> it's definitely a, a name that I've heard of in the past, and I'm not really sure why it didn't pop up in my research. Uh, there's just, there's so many games. <laughs> uh, uh, Hans uh, mentioned the best unknown and not mentioned Rondell game is Roundhouse. Uh, that is one that uh, I've not played, but I remember when it came out, and there's uh, there's a decent bit of hype. It was not huge hype, but there was it was medium heat hype. Uh, and I heard really good things about it. Um, it was on my essentially long list that I wanted to get around to. Also, Hamburgum was on my long list. Uh, I, I wanted to play Hamburgum before I uh, made this vlog, but I wanted to play Shipyard and Navigador uh, and Murano uh, first as uh, Sovereign Skies was another one that was on that list that I really wanted to play. So I, I didn't actually get to that. Uh, I did play Glasgow. Uh, Devin asked if I played Glasgow yet. Um, that was one of the ones that I played in my Blitz <laughs> as I played all of these different Rondell games. Uh, it was a fine game. Uh, it was cute, I guess. Like, it was fun enough, but at the end of the game, it's a two-player only game. Uh, myself and my opponent, we're not really sure we were that interested in playing it again. Uh, it has a time track element to it as you are building a communal city in the middle. And when I considered adding it to this list, it just didn't seem like it had anything Rondell-wise that really jumped out that, that made it deserve a spot on the list, if that makes sense. Okay, I've talked for quite some time. I think this is probably a good spot to bring this one to a close. Uh, thank you to everyone who has been participating, uh, watching this one live, as well as everyone who's going to watch this one later on. Uh, this has been quite a trek. I I'm really happy to have this done, and I've actually been really enjoying talking about this. Um, I put more work into this video than almost any other vlog I've ever made. I mean, I, I think this was m uh, easily twice the amount of work uh, that essentially other any other top 10 list has been, uh, which has been fascinating. I I've really enjoyed this deep delve. It's been a great excuse to explore a part of board gaming that I enjoy that I had never really thought about that much. So yeah, that is going to bring this one to a close. Thanks again to everybody who's watched.